at a high level, what it means is that we we now have a 10 year period of time for most of the credits that are in the act uh, that people can plan around, which is the longest time period we've had in our history. Welcome to Buzz House, a Baker Tilly podcast where you can find all the buzz around multifamily housing. I'm Don Bernards, the partner in charge of Baker Tilly's multifamily housing practice. And I'm Garrett Gibson, a partner at Baker Tilly, also specializing in consulting on multifamily housing transactions across the country. Each week, we'll bring you a guest or a topic in the multifamily housing industry that will help you win now and anticipate tomorrow. Let's get started. We welcome into the Buzz House today our colleague Mike Land, a Senior Managing Director at Baker Tilly within our energy and infrastructure practice. Mike will be joining us today to discuss the impacts of the Inflation Reduction Act signed into uh, law by President Biden on August 16th, and we'll focus primarily on solar and how it will relate to your multifamily project. I think and Mike will get into this, but I think a lot of the, the discussion could be, you know, wind, maybe some geothermal, things of that nature. So but we're just very excited. A lot of calls, a lot of discussion, you know, something and I think Mike will get into this, but I think it covers like 50 some credits, Mike, or 70 some credits, obviously, again, focusing primarily on solar in our relation to uh, multifamily housing. So really with that, a lot to discuss. We're going to jump into our discussion with Mike and I'll, we'll start with Garrick. Yeah, and thanks, Don. And uh, thanks for joining us, Mike. So before we get we get off with our questions for our listeners, would you please give a little background of your professional career? Sure. First, thanks for having me. I joined our firm in 1997, so I've been here a little bit. My background predominantly was uh, was on the transaction side for the first 10 years or so of my career, helping clients buy and sell companies and fund projects across a wide range of industries. Beginning late 07, early 08, uh, I helped create and found our, our energy and infrastructure group focusing on, on clean energy. And um, since then, we've been involved with many, many clients around the country working with um, a wide range of technologies and, and project types and in industries, including wind, solar, biomass, biogas, geothermal heating and cooling, hydro. These are all technologies that we've supported clients as they uh, as they navigate this space. You know, in 2009, the Recovery Act created a very broad and deep set of incentives. It helped create a lot of outcomes. And the Inflation Reduction Act here that just passed is uh, is just truly a remarkable piece of legislation in terms of the impact it's going to have on the industry. Much, much greater impact than what we saw of the Recovery Act. And so there's it creates a lot of opportunities for, for many of our clients, and we really look forward to working with them. Great. Thanks, Mike. And then that actually is great. Now we can start uh, our questions within the context of the Inflation Act. So what is the exact timing for getting the benefits of various provisions within that act? For instance, the no basis reduction, the increased credit percentages, and uh, the easier structure to use to be able to, to sell and monetize the credits. Yeah, the timing constructs that are in IRA 22 are, are important to to get a good handle on um, at a high level, we found as as we're working through and trying to work with clients to sort out how their situation meshes with the timing considerations. So there's kind of three buckets of timing. The prior tax credit regime that has existed for many years and had certain aspects of it being phased down, for instance, solar was going from 30%, had gone down to 26% as an ITC and had another phase out schedule. Certain other technologies had begun construction timelines that had lapsed. So that that whole regime under this act has essentially been restored to almost its prior glory as a way to think about it, back to whatever whatever levels it was at. And that's for the year 2022, retroactive to January 1st. So if clients are placing projects in service in 2022, you're really under the old regime at its greatest levels. Beginning and for projects that are placed in service in 2023 forward, there are enhancements to existing credits in terms of their sizing and their scope. There are additional credits for uh, newer technologies that have been added. And there are also the ability to monetize the credits as a, a very different set of circumstances now where for the first time you can, what they call it transferability, you can sell credits. And also if you are a tax exempt entity, uh, you are actually eligible now for these credits and you can get a direct pay from the IRS when you place a project in service. All of those new, that new regime 
begins for projects that are placed in service in 2023, but the be but the timing considerations are that it uh, more around when you begin construction, which is a technical term under IRS guidance. So what that means is clients can start on projects now and place them in service after January 1st of 23 forward and qualify under the new regime. The last bucket from a timing standpoint is beginning in 2025, this act goes away from technology specific credits, wind, solar, biomass, geothermal, to uh, technology agnostic credits that are based on carbon emission reductions. And so there's uh, there's a lot to unpack in that timing, but at a high level, what it means is that we, we now have a 10 year period of time for most of the credits that are in the act uh, that people can plan around, which is the longest time period we've had in our history. So it's um, those things really bode well for for folks to do some good planning and, and achieve some outcomes. Mike, thank you very much for that. And I think that that 10 years, I think, is huge. And I know we were on another call earlier today that, you know, the 45 L was there, but it ended and it wasn't renewed. And it was just no one really not as many people got into it, maybe as you would think, because of that that timeline. So 10 years is fantastic. Mike, a thing that everyone is talking about are these credit percentages, you know, on on the low side it's 6%, but oh my gosh, affordable, it could be as much as 70, but it's all these levels in between. Can you give us some 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 overview and what are those tranches of percentages mean? How do I get there? A little bit about that. Sure. So what the IRA 22 did is it created a base credit and then there are several bonus credits that add on top of the base. So in the prior law, there was just a credit. There was just a percentage. And you you either qualified and you either got 30% or you didn't. Under the current law, the base percentage for the investment tax credits, um, and this same concept applies to production tax credits as well, but for investment tax credits, the base credit is six. And then each successive adder has a 2% adder to it. So domestic content is one of the bonus criteria. That would get you another 2%. If you're in what's called an energy community, which I can define in a second, you get another 2%. And then specific to housing, um, if you do wind or solar or storage in uh, on low income or um, uh, housing projects, um, you get another 10%, another 2%. And then if you if you structure the benefits of that in a certain way that they uh, that at least 50% of them go to low to moderate income, providers directly, there's another 2%. So six, two, 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 and two. Um, you know, that adds up to, I believe, 14%. If you then meet prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements, each of those is multiplied by five. So the base credit would now be 30%, and then each successive adder would be 10. So if you hit all of them, you could get as high as 70% in this industry. 70% of the eligible cost of a qualifying project. The only other thing I guess I would add is um, if you if you hit the base and you didn't meet domestic content and you were not in an energy community, but you qualified on those other two, they, they don't all have to be bundled together. So, you know, you in that case, you would be at 50% if you did not have domestic content or you were not in an energy community. So that's important for folks to understand that um, that these are independent adders, but they are all impacted materially by the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirement. And I just want to add that add before our next question, Mike, just for all our listeners, right? You think about this, if you have a 50 to 70 percent uh, energy credit, and one thing we didn't touch on is this no longer the solar credit will no longer reduce your light take eligible basis as it had under the old regime, uh, if you will. And so Right, so you have you have the solar at maybe 50, maybe 70. You've got the benefit of either your 4% credit, your 9% credit, maybe it's in a QCT. I mean, you might be getting a, 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 over 100%, you know, credits equal to over 100% of the cost. I mean, obviously the pricing and things like that and how you sell it, but it's it's really exciting, I think, for our, our multifamily deals, especially affordable deals. Uh, yeah, and, back and you know, one other thing to add for those, you know, for-profit entities that, you know, these transfer, these credits are now sellable. You can sell them once, um, but they are sellable. You need to sell them at the partnership level, and you you don't have to sell the full dollar amount. You can sell whatever dollar amount you uh, choose to sell. When you sell the credits, there is no taxable income to you on the sale. There's also no basis that the buyer obtains 
that they can then depreciate. But it's a it's a very, very powerful set of incentives. Thanks for that. You know, the more we hear and, uh, and the more that comes out of this, uh, the better it sounds. And that kind of leads me to my question. What actually can be done until the regulations actually fully come out? Uh, in other words, w- what all applies now? And, and if people are starting now on a project and it's under construction, what would apply to them? This question is the biggest question that we are helping clients with now, meaning the question of timing. How does this apply to projects that are already under construction? How does it apply to projects I'm going to start? What should I do differently timing wise because this law has passed? You know, the way this is set up is if a project is placed in service in 2022, it it qualifies under the prior regime and uh, and the credits are not saleable. And they're not, you know, under the transferability. So, you know, that's not a bad outcome. Um, it was better than the outcome prior to the act passing because, like, for instance, with solar, the, the credit itself is larger. Um, we have a number of clients in various industries, various project types that are considering the cost benefit of delaying placing a project in service until calendar year 2023. So those are projects that are already being built. And would therefore, if they are placed in service in twenty in twenty twenty three after January first, would qualify for a larger credit amount, and would also have more options as to how they could monetize the credits. That's a cost benefit decision, though, for each client to try to think their way through. The placed in service requirements and uh, and reg and, and regulations are something to be very careful about. There's there's several of them, and it's important if if somebody's going to pursue that strategy to make sure that they really it's a belt and suspenders kind of approach to make sure if you are delaying so that your place in service is in 23 that the IRS would agree with you, and then it's actually placed you know that you met that requirement. So that's just something of note. The other thing is um, regarding projects that maybe would normally be starting later than ne- than in the, like next few months but for this law. And what I mean by that is um, there, the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirement that that raises the value of all the credits in that chain, that requirement only applies once there's been guidance provided by the IRS around what the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements are. That is a specific stipulation in the law. And the way that's worded is that um, if you meet begun construction within 59 days after the prevailing wage and apprenticeship guidance has been provided, if you meet begun construction within 59 days after the guidance, you are automatically deemed to have met the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements. We call it a prevailing wage and apprenticeship safe harbor. And so what that means is that um, um, and begun construction has its own set of uh, requirements under prior guidance that has been utilized for the last first for the first about five years after 2009 under the 1603 grant program which was adjudicated by and administered by the treasury and then uh, in the middle of the uh, uh, right i believe it's like 2015 the irs adopted begun construction guidelines as well that really mimicked for the most part um, and built on the begun construction requirements under the 1603 program. So what does that mean? That means most practitioners are looking at it as those begun construction uh, rules and guidance will apply here. And if clients can go through go through that planning exercise and then contract with vendors in the right way that meets the begun construction requirements, they may be able to put themselves in a position where they are automatically deemed to have met prevailing wage and apprenticeship. And once you meet begun construction, you have four calendar years to place a project in service and meet what's called a continuity safe harbor. It's a lot of detail, but those considerations are something we're working with a number of clients on now to sort through. And that's all based on prior guidance. And there, there's the risk that there could be guidance that comes out that might vary from what has existed in the past. Most of these credits are still under Section 48, and so that guidance that's been there is expected to be consistent, but it's there's there's some real cost benefit decisions here to try to think through is, I guess, the point. Mike, thank you very much for that. A lot of good things to think about. And maybe, you know, one last question, Mike, I think a lot of people want to reach out to you because I think there's a lot of questions. And even my last question is, you know, how much how much solar do I add? I know they're, you know, looking at all these benefits, there's the credits. I'm sure there's some type of, you know, probably energy studies, things like that. I mean, how, you know, where do you even begin? If you're, you know, if you're a developer, where do you begin? How do you start thinking about these types of things? Yeah, it's a, 
that that's a really good question and um it, it you know i'm i'm glad i'm glad to be uh, working at a firm like ours where we have uh, many colleagues with a lot of backgrounds and uh, and experiences um my experience predominantly is working with with clients that have already decided what to build and they've had they've had you know others sort out sort that out we have others in our firm who can help sort through what's the right approach in terms of sizing or designing you know a solar or microgrid or storage for a given facility some of the considerations that they look at is you know what are the what's the total electric load of the facility and should you you know should you consider putting in ev charging stations and those kinds of things um what's the price of the power um who based on the specific location what utility and uh, regional transmission operator and what are the rules around generating your own power and consuming it those rules are a bit of a patchwork quilt around the country and so there's some um, it, it's kind of it's very much location specific as to what's the right design to add this you know to a housing project and not just a housing project but certainly to a housing project and um you know the other thing as i understand it is that um depending there's all there can also be a potential positive impact on the value of the 45l based on how your design fits so it's it's a little bit of a of a rubik's cube that you know that requires some careful thought and in time and effort but those that's my understanding of the of the, of the kinds of considerations that uh, that we can help people with very good mike thank you very much for your time today to join the bus house i think there's I'm, I'm i'm excited i know talking to a lot of our clients i think there's a lot more to come please reach out to uh to mike and myself with and, and garrick with with questions and listeners thank you for tuning in today Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Buzz House. To receive a notification when new episodes are available, please subscribe to Buzz House, a Bakatilly podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. For additional resources around multifamily housing, check out bakertilly.com. And if you have a suggested topic, please send them to build at bakertilly.com. That's B-U-I-L-D at bakertilly.com.